moderator for today. Before we begin our webinar, I'll quickly go through a few housekeeping details. This session will be recorded and shared with all registrants. We will open the floor for a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. You can type in your questions in the chat box at any point during the presentation and we'll get to it at the end. Um, during this webinar, language industry experts Tony O'Dowd and Keith Pivashi will discuss the highlights of 2016 and what to expect in 2017. While I'm sure everyone here is acquainted with Tony and Keith Pee's work, I'll briefly introduce them to our audience. Tony is the CEO and Chief Architect of ContentNTV.com. He has more than 25 years experience. He has more than 25 years experience in the localization industry, and has previously held senior positions at Lotus Semantic Coral and Alchemy Software Development, which he founded in 2000. Kitivashi is an independent machine translation technology and process consultant. He was previously the VP of Enterprise Translation Sales for Asia Online, and responsible for the worldwide business and marketing strategy at Language Weaver, STL. He has worked with both large and global companies and small startups. You can read more about Kirti's views on his blog called NT Pages. Now, without further delay, I hand over the mic to Tony, who will help us look back on NT Trends of 2016 and talk about how automated translation technology and the language industry will march forward in 2017. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Palumi, and welcome everybody um, to today's webinar. And I'd like a, a special welcome to Curti, who will be um, uh, speaking with me and presenting some of his thoughts for uh, this year and next year as well. So, um, 2016 has been a very, very busy, very busy year um, in the industry. And I guess, you know, there's so much went on during the year, it's sometimes hard to distill five things that really made the industry different or developed the industry or brought the industry to a new level of footing um, um, globally. So um, forgive me if I miss one of your favorite points, but these are the five things that really jumped out to me uh, when I look back um, and look at the highlights of 2016. And I guess the first thing that we've seen really become um, a standard, I guess, for localization was the fully integrated localization pipeline where we now see translation memory and machine translation blended together in a fully automated workflow um, to bring optimum efficiency and reduction in costs. And one of the key technologies that has driven that level of integration of translation memory and machine translation is the emergence of predictive quality estimation technology uh, for statistical and phrase-based machine translation systems. Now, when you think about predicting quality, we do this today using translation memory systems, or CAT tools such as Trados and MemoQ and so on. And I guess what we use there is the fuzzy match scores. So we get a sense that when we run a new project through a TM, um, how much we can translate at 100%, how much we can translate at 90% and 80% and so on. That fuzzy match score is a predictive score. It predicts how much reuse we have. And by Analyzing that score, project managers can determine the uh, schedule of a project, how many resources they need, and more importantly, the cost of the project. So you could say that that ability to predict um, the level of reuse or the quality of that um, reuse has been really a cornerstone in how to successfully manage um, translation projects. With the emergence of machine translation, that was a big challenge. How do you predict the quality that a machine translation system can deliver. And that was one of the first problems that uh, we put our heads together and tried to solve in Canton. And we, we, helped, we were helped along the way with the Center of Next Generation Localization beside us here on campus, and which is now called the ADAPT Center. And we created a system where we could actually give you a translation through an MT system, one of our MT systems. And we could also say, well, hey, you know what? The quality of this is 83% or 84% or 70%. The lower the quality, the more post-editing. The higher that percentage, the, um, the less post-editing required. And the key thing about that number was that it fitted into this fuzzy match score, which, of course, is a percentage score between 0 and 100. So now we have this seamless ability to blend translation memory and machine translation 
still give these fuzzy match and um, um, project manager um, uh, reports to um, project managers, and they can determine the cost, the schedule, and resources of the project. Uh, the three key things that a project manager um, has to generate. And in fact, we're not alone in doing this because many of our um, competitors, and you know, it's great to be in a competitive market. We get and um, it keeps us all honest and, and innovative. And many of our competitors have also this year brought out predictive quality estimation um, technologies for their MT systems. So globally, is now have a predictive quality estimation technology, SDL and TAIU, just to name um, three of them. So it has been a year where we now can see fully integrated um, localization um, workflows. And the next thing that really jumps out is that machine translation has got a hell of a lot faster and a hell of a lot cheaper. And let me give you some examples here. At the start of this year, the um, training time for um, a Cantan engine was around 4 million words per hour. And in the middle, um, Q, at the end of Q1, early Q2, we had increased that to about 6 million words per hour. And by upgrading all of the servers on the Canton platform, or the Canton cloud, as we call it, we have about 700 servers on our cloud, we were able to increase that to about 10 million words per hour. So now we have clients building very, very large engines within a single working day. Now, that may seem like a small thing, but it's a huge thing in terms of building higher productivity into engineering teams and increasing their ability to deliver higher quality um, engines. And during that period, by the way, we were able to reduce our costs, our monthly subscription costs to our clients um, by uh, 25%. So we increased efficiency by 60% and reduced the cost by 25%. And if you look across the industry, all of the major players in MT have seen um, there or has, have announced cost reductions this year um, to make um, MT more affordable uh, cheaper and obviously make it faster um, as well. Um, in the middle of um, 2016, we introduced this verb, this uh, acronym FAUT, which stands for Fully Automated Usable Translation. And this was a concept that we worked with um, as um, very closely with one of our largest clients who um, wanted to translate billions of words of e-commerce content but they didn't want to go through um, a post-editing process. They wanted to serve those words directly to web, as we called it. So that was fully automated, usable translation. And this was the word that, word that we adopted, or this acronym that we used to actually describe how a lot of the e-commerce clients are currently using MT today. So while it was novel at the start of the year, today all of our e-commerce clients um, tend to use fully automated, usable, usable translation. And that just means that they can translate billions of words without any operator intervention or human um, translator intervention. Now, that doesn't mean we don't build the engines without using professional translators. Far from it. They are a key component, a key part of building a high-quality engine is including professional translators. But when you go into operational or production, um, you can actually run the system with pretty much zero um, user operator involvement. And that's been a real big success. And it is now, believe it or not, guys, that pretty much the de facto standard um, for hospitality sites and e-commerce sites um, that we uh, work on. And if I talk to some of our um, colleagues in other companies, competitors of ours, I'm hearing the same story as well. Everybody wants to get super fast, fully automated, usable um, translation. And the next thing then is um, quality. Quality has improved and it's now very measurable. In fact, if there's one theme that jumps out with at me, and we went to 24 shows this year, and if there's one theme that jumps out over and over and over again is measurement of quality. We've got to be able to measure this. And uh, many vendors have spent the, the last year measuring quality and improving translation outputs. And they've adopted multiple approaches um, to achieve higher levels of quality. So for instance, SDL this year announced their adaptive MT system, which tries to improve quality by continuously learning what post-edits are actioned by translators, and then incrementally retraining individual systems based on those post-edits. A really, really nice approach. I think we have to take our hats off. They're really making some nice inroads there. We have a new kind of um, energetic startup called LILT, that is using deep machine learning to predict the most likely next, next word that a translator is going to type 
And as they type that, the system learns um, and modifies or enhances this, the individual system on the fly. Um, a project that was supported by the European Union as part of the Connecting European um, facility, Modern MT, um, uses contextual analyzers to determine the domain that the translation is required for, and then super fast learning algorithms to retrain a community-based MT system on the fly. And that's a really nice piece of technology. Um, it's almost unfortunate that they're coming to market when neural networks, which is the next big um, announcement in 2016, um, is starting to gain a lot of traction and a lot of research dollars as well. And then, of course, Canton, we released our ISO technology, which is instant segment retraining technology that allows us to instantly retrain an engine on the fly. Um, so it's like adaptive. It's our version of adaptive um, MT. And of course, in terms of neuro, which is a big news story, and I know um, Curti has a lot of good insights there. Um, Google has officially launched their Chinese neural engine, um, and that was released only in September of this year. So lots of things, lots of people are focused on how to improve the quality and how to measure it, and lots of vendors are using different approaches. I guess the question for 2017 is, which one will prevail? And we're going to talk about that um, later on. Another part of measuring quality, of course, is that um, a lot of the ISVs take measuring quality very, very seriously. They want to know not only how much the quality has improved in their um, machine translation engines, but they also want to know the productivity enhancements that they're experiencing because of those quality improvements. So I think during 2016, EQF, uh, Dynamic Quality Framework, which was introduced in 2014 by TAUS, is a solution, a viable solution that offers um, a way to manage translation um, um, quality evaluations and to peer, to benchmark them against your peers. It's a really nice approach there. And of course, our vendors, our clients take measuring quality incredibly serious. And that's the reason we built this year um, a new technology called Canton LQR, which um, stands for Language Quality Review Portal. And it's a fully automated distributed workforce that manages large teams of translators um, involved in measuring MT um, outputs. And of course, this year we saw lots and lots of plugins for the likes of Trados and MemoQ and other CAP tools that measure translator post edits and compute translation quality and productivity um, statistics from that as well. So measuring quality has improved, and now we have better ways to measure, probably more ways to measure quality data than we ever had before. Um, another big emergence in the market is that the LSP community and um, the ISV community have firmly embraced the cloud for the provision of MT services. Um, the cloud um, itself is a tremendous platform in which to deliver SaaS-based MT services be it a public cloud or a private cloud. And to be honest, the vast majority of MT players today offer fully cloud-based um, deployments. And in fact, some of the um, longest serving companies are most traditionally oriented or longest established companies who have avoided using the cloud for years. This year broke um, with, the, with the cloud and joined and released cloud ver versions um, of your application. So I guess um, if you're not on the cloud, it's quite simple. You're probably going out of business um, in this market at this stage. So what does um, um, 2017 hold? Well, you know, it's, it's really hard to predict. Um, you know, would we have predicted Brexit, for instance? Probably not. Okay, with all the brains that we have in this um, entire campus, we probably wouldn't have predicted Brexit. Um, and there's many other shocks that have hit the um, system. Um, across the world, uh, Brexit being only one example. So it's really hard for me to predict 2017. Um, but there are some trends um, that are emerging, and these are trends that we have to really, really look out for. So I think you'll see a continuous push of the boundaries and the limits of uh, machine translation. So we're going to see, obviously, the evolutions, the continued evolution of SMT systems. Um, 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 statistical machine translation systems. So watch out for new reordering models and pre-ordering models for complex languages. For instance, last year we launched three um, new pre-ordering models for Japanese, Chinese, and German, and we saw significant improvements in our engines. And you know that's a really exciting way of improving the quality of SMT. So I think you'll see more of those um, approaches um, appear this year. In fact, our um, academic paper on our reordering approach will be published in Q1 in January, actually, of next year. 
You'll also see a continued push towards adaptive MT um, for SMT. I think you'll, you'll see that um, um, SDL has made a big um, um, leap in that particular area, and I think we've made our own leap using ISR technology. I think you'll see the other vendors follow suit and start looking at that. I think you'll also see some interesting combination or hybrid systems appear in 2017. For instance, Neural network is definitely a key thing that we have to um, be cognizant of and something that we have to all work with. In fact, um, I know of several of the large vendors, including ourselves, are working with neural today. But I think you'll see hybrid systems that combine the best of SMT and the tentative um, capabilities of neural networks. And you'll see them combine together in pipeline solutions so that you get, you get the best of SMT with the best of neural. And you'll be able to do that at a very good economic price because you won't need those big, powerful GPU machines to deliver that type of solution. Um, of course, um, research will forge ahead into new territories for a neural network. You know, the things that we're looking at at the moment, and I'm sure the rest of the industry are going to be looking at these things as well, is training times. You know, it's not conscionable that it can take three weeks to build an engine. The decoding speeds are certainly not where they should be compared to some of the current systems. Our current system runs at about 100 TPS. Our neural system doesn't run anywhere close to that speed yet. Um, I think you'll see announcements or improvements in the way we evaluate uh, neural MT outputs. Because Blue Score, which has been the predominant automated score for the um, industry for the last several years, is not really suitable um, for um, neural networks. And I think Curti will explain why that is the case um, later on. Also, NMT models are awkward, they're large, they're bulky, and we're going to see the emergence of some pruning technologies and optimization technologies to really make them less awkward and bulky. Um, so that, I think there's some really nice things that are going to happen this year, um, both on SMT systems and on neural. And of course, one of the biggest problems that we have in MT is that today we tend to translate within the boundaries of a sentence. And I think some, some really exciting research is being done at the moment. Um, it's been spearheaded by some of the guys over here in ADAPT, um, the ADAPT Center here, where we're taking MT systems and moving beyond the boundaries of sentences. And that gives us contextualization of translation outputs, which is showing very, very um, good improvements in translation. Um, I think measurement quality will be super, super important this year. Uh, just look at neural systems. So one of the key challenges is exactly how do neural systems outperform SMT. We don't really know that at the moment. We have anecdotal evidence. We have simple measurements going on and experiments. But we don't really know how good these systems are. So expect to see some exciting developments on measuring and technology. I can imagine that we'll have a new measurement system called NBLUE, Neural Blue, or Blue for Neural Networks, because the current Blue system, or Blue algorithms, just won't work. And I guess the question would be, who the hell is going to come out with this new measurement system for neural networks? Um, for the industry, in terms of measuring quality, it's really important. Um, they're starting to embrace DQF. They're starting to use MQM. MQM is the multidimensional quality framework. But it's too comprehensive. It's, too, it's a bit of a monster to work with. So what will come next? We've got to simplify the way we measure quality. We've almost over-engineered how we um, measure quality. Um, so we've got this really comprehensive framework called MQM, but it has a lot of hassle and um, operational complexity to it. So you know, I think we'll see some exciting developments there um, in simplifying that and maybe bringing that down to normalization or the, the core factors of how you measure um, quality. And of course, driven by the TAUS uh, DQF platform, we've been accumulating lots and lots of measurements and data in relation to quality. But of course, we have to organize that into information. And then you take information, and by um, analyzing, you create business intelligence. I think the industry today is at the data collection part. We need to really figure out how we analyze this data and organize it so we can create information out of it. And then hopefully, we can, we can develop really good business intelligence. We're not quite there yet. Perhaps 2017 would be the year that that actually happens. Um, in terms of online user activity and multi-user experience, if you think about um, what we've been translating with machine translation systems so far, it's pretty much content that's generated by the user. So it's user-generated content. So we're translating web forums, blogs, community content, customer reviews, wiki pages, e-commerce sites, and so on. And these are tremendously powerful tools for enhancing 
multilingual, multilingual customer experience. Um, so I think we do that today using offline systems. I think in 2017, because computing power is so freely available and the cloud is becoming more prominent and prominent as a, as a technology, you'll see all that switch over to real-time machine translation. So we won't be doing it asynchronously as we do it today. We'll be doing it fully synchronous, where real-time MT will be a real added advantage to enhancing the multi-user um, experience. Now, for the LS commu LSP community, of course, this is going to mean a massive increase in translation capacity because there's going to be a lot more stuff translated this year. And obviously, because this is all online, the turnaround time is going to be compressed. You've got lots more content, which means you need more capacity, and you've got shorter turnaround times, which means you need more efficiency. So this whole idea of being able to translate something using a machine translation system, measure the quality of it, in other words, predict the quality, and if it's low quality, to workflow that off for post-editing and only publish stuff that's of high quality, I think you're going to see some really interesting solutions um, um, come to the market this year. In fact, um, Unbabel, which is a very nice solution, has that kind of flavor of that in there. Um, Lilt also has some aspect of that in it um, as well. For MT publishers, we need to develop, develop all of our solutions for any time, anywhere, any device. So that's like the old strategy of Microsoft, guys, the 3A strategy used to be called. And we need to be able to deliver these solutions now at super fast um, speed. And I think the one focus that will make a big difference this year is cracking the economics behind the provision of neural network. The computing cost of a neural NT system is so enormous at the moment, whoever cracks the economics of that problem will most likely be the biggest vendor of neural MT and going forward. And so that's something to look out for. Who's going to crack the economics um, of providing um, MT? So that's my two cents worth. I'm going to hand you over now to um, our esteemed uh, second speaker here, Curti, who will now share his thoughts um, and what he sees what's going to happen um, in 2017. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, hello. Is uh, my sound coming through right now? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Tony. And uh, so let me just dive right into what was happening. This slide here is a slide that was presented by the Google CEO in April of 2016, basically showing the volume of machine translation that Google does on a daily basis. And you see that it's in the range of 140 billion words a day, and it continues to grow. I, I think billion days it may be as much as 175 billion words a day today. And you can see that you know Russian, German, Arabic, Portuguese, and Italian are the major languages going into in and out of English. That and so you, Google alone is doing in the 150 billion words a day range. When you add Facebook and Microsoft and some of the other large public portals like Baidu in China, Naver in Korea, Yandex in, China, in Russia, and then you know just everyone in the translation industry, in the professional translation industry, which includes Anton, Sistran, FDL, Iconic Taoyu, we're easily over 500 billion words a day. You know, the bulk of this are public, coming from the public portal is probably the largest in the translation industry is STL, and they're only 20 billion words a month. So, you know, but the, the key to understand there is that, you know, the players in the translation industry are much more focused on the highest quality. The rest of the world is what we call generic machine translation, so they 
you know, it's a, a solution, it's a single solution for any and every kind of translation. So it's for the casual internet user. And what the translation industry tends to do is to raise the quality of machine translation to to levels of you know output quality levels that are useful in a professional context, you know, in a business context that have value to enable international commerce or international pro communications around products and services. And so, much more challenging part of the market, but you know, definitely smaller in terms of the big picture. But you know, for anyone who is wondering, you know, is machine translation for real? I don't know if there's a better slide than this to show how dominant um, translation in the world today is using computers. Um, so I think this is only going to grow as most of the new online world is coming from the you know what used to be called the third world, and so none of those people speak English. So you know the need for machine translation for Indian languages, for example, and African languages is going to grow dramatically. Um, in 2016, we saw the arrival of neural machine translation. It's, you know, and neural machine translation is just a new way to solve the basic machine translation problem, you know, which is we have so, a lot of source text and we want to convert it into some target language text. And how do we do this? You know, and human beings have been attempting to solve this problem with varieties of different approaches, you know, and, um, you know, there's been an evolutionary growth in the quality of the effort. Um, but it is one of the most difficult problems in the artificial intelligence in the computing field. You know, if you talk to people that are looking at broad computing problems, you know, in the artificial intelligence area, they will say that the language translation problem is probably the single most complex problem possible. And it's, it will take the longest to solve. So, um, you know, we see that uh, Facebook was really the first to really let loose large-scale uh, neural machine translation systems. And, you know, it's, it's hidden inside their wall and, you know, when you're looking at translations within the Facebook environment. A lot of that, oh, all of that now is coming from neural machine translation. I believe, you know, it, over the year they phased out what they used to originally have with Microsoft technology and have switched completely to their neural approach. Google made a big announcement uh, in the late this year with their neural machine translation, originally starting with Chinese, but now there's several other languages that are also up, and we're getting very good feedback. And interestingly, what you see is that while blue scores are not that much better, the human response to the quality of the translation, to the actual translation, is much more positive. You know, Human beings feel that this is better, it's significantly better, even though there may only be a, t a two or three blue point difference. Sistrans, the first real solution that is available that you can buy today um, in the professional translation arena. And I've, I have spoken to several actual users of the translation, both in the LSP world and in the corporate world, who are actually delivering solutions using that technology today. Microsoft has their, uh, their uh, stuff already out on the phone and will are imminently going to release their you know their uh, neural solutions on the web as well and Canton has also begun ex experiments with um, neural machine translation and probably will release something in 2017 but a thing to to keep in mind is that neural machine translation requires very substantial investment not just in computing, but it requires... Yeah. Is, oh, sorry for interrupting you there. Um, there is a feedback from the mic. I suppose if you could just um, speak a bit away from the mic, that would be great. Okay. A lot of noise on the okay. mic. Sorry I'm about sorry. that. Okay, yes. is this better? Oh, yes, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so, you know, when people say they are beginning to look at neural machine translation, you should expect that it'll be 12, 15 months before they're able to actually deliver anything that would be of use to anybody. Um, 
I think one of the most exciting, actually, uh, possibly more exciting for the professional translation industry is a technology called adaptive machine translation. And this is basically it's a phrase-based machine translation, you know, SMT engine that learns in real time so that every corrective input it gets is immediately added into the engine's learning mode and it immediately learns not to make that error again. Now sometimes it might take you know two or three uh, correction you know the, the same correction needs to be received two or three times but the key is that it learns sort of almost instantly there is not a batch process where you you know you you build an engine you translate 250,000 words and then you send back the corrections and then you relearn those corrections and so the next project is a little bit better this is learning on a moment to moment basis and if you have 10 post editors working on the same engine at the same time what is happening is that every uh, individual editors corrections benefit every single person that is working in the team so I, I believe that for the professional industry this is you know this is the best solution I've talked to several translators who have a very positive response to you know this approach even translators that work with German there's a company called Lilt that's based um, in California that is, is, is a new startup that is sort of leading the way on the adaptive machine translation front but we also see SDL is coming up strong in the in the you know and will be releasing their version and their implementation of adaptive um, adaptive machine translation within the next three to six months um, many people who have interacted with this technology describe it as a next generation approach to post editing because what happens here is that you have an engine that is learning constantly and and in real time so it's not it's it, you know it's a it's sort of like teaching students in a class and every day you know as you go through each new chapter their ability to understand more complex things and more co comprehensive things is better so it's a it's a very uh, i think a, a very promising approach that will gain um, momentum in the professional industry itself. So in terms of um, what is likely to happen in 2017, you know, I have some opinions, you know, they're just opinions, but, and who knows what will actually happen, but I think neural machine translation is clearly showing promise. You know, there are all these tests that the university communities do where they build systems across many different languages and they measure how good these systems are. They all start with the same set of data so no one can cheat and they all test it on the same sets of uh, tests and so you have a fairly objective measure and, and we see neural machine translation is winning in pretty much every language except for one or two and um, so it's very clear that neural machine translation is the way forward but it's very expensive it's very complicated and it's complicated in terms of the thinking required to build them properly and also it's complicated in terms of the computing requirements needed there so you know it'll take investment of both intellectual and financial investment for the computing. Sistran is going to, you know, the, the first generation of neural machine translation engines are generic engines. That means they can't really be tuned for an individual corporation's needs or an individual enterprise's needs. But Sistran has started building domain-adapted NMT systems, and I have seen evidence of some of these systems, and I, they will introduce it in a larger scale in uh, early 2017. But in general, you know, when you see that other MT vendors talk about NMT, you will see they will all complain about the computing costs and, their, and the complexity because no one actually really understands why this technology is working, but, you know, they're just seeing that, okay, it does produce better output. We're not quite sure why, you know, and if you talk to NMT, um, 
you know, people with deep knowledge of the algorithms un underlying the technology. Very few can really explain why. You know, it's it's it, unlike statistical machine translation where you knew if the da data was good and if the, the you know if you match the phrase patterns with the source data, then there was a chance that you wouldn't get. You know, so you could steer the technology to, to some extent. NMT is a much less steerable technology at this point in time because it's it's still new. It's it's the way it learns is kind of mysterious. You know, computers have ways of determining patterns that you know human that are that are opaque to human beings and not easily visible. I think we're going to see, and we're already seeing some of these tools are available right now. But uh, Moses was a toolkit that allowed people in the research community to build statistical engines. There is something called Tianos that is available in the neural machine translation world, but not for the faint-hearted. I mean, you need, as I said, you need to have hardcore hard computing resources. So, you know, the, and for the average layperson, this means a GPU instead of a CPU. But if you look at what Microsoft and Google are doing, Google has actually designed a, a special CPU that will is designed for these kinds of applications, you know, that and they will that they will be using for the neural machine translation. And Microsoft has modified existing, um, you know, what's called a floating point gate array technology. You know, it's it's just like a really fast processor that allows you to run certain kinds of computations. And so this is what is necessary to work with this technology because, as Tony said, it takes weeks to train an engine. Um, the Sistran systems are running now in real time. They're running at like 60, 70 percent of the SMT speeds. So you know, if you if you do it right, it is possible to deploy them with some ease. It's still very complex to train them, but I think there's enough um, momentum here, given that Facebook, Baidu, Google, Microsoft, and all the big computational linguistics universities in the world have basically said that, okay, we see NMT is the future, that it is going to be the future. And it, it is very likely that over a three to five year time frame, it's going to replace phrase-based SMT because it's sort of a natural evolution of phrase-based SMT. It's, it's just machine learning that is deeper and more powerful than in the current generation. Um, adaptive machine translation is also evolving and I think in terms of the best quality MT output for 2017, I would bet that the AMT systems are most likely going to outperform um, in the NMT systems as well. So in very domain adapted, very focused systems, um, you'll see that AMT systems where you have lots of feedback coming in from post editors, you will have quality that will be better than anything else available. Um, SDL has an ecosystem with Trados and the translation management systems and their ability to interact with lots of internal translators that if they did everything correctly, they could be a formidable competitor to Lilt and dominate this market. But at this point in time, Lilt is clearly the leader and it's the most elegant deployment of this technology. I mean, and we see also that Canton is, you know, not going to be sitting by on the on the sidelines here. They have introduced elements that allow you to make changes immediately. I think this is an important thing for the professional translation industry. This ability to tell the engine, okay, learn this. I don't want. I don't want to need. I don't want to have to fix the same problem over and over again. Here are some things that you know you should learn to do better. And you know you should not have to say this repeatedly. You should not have to say it hundreds and thousands of times like you used to be have to. It should learn immediately. It should be dynamic and real. You know that's the point of having computers. And I s suspect that this adaptive machine translation will very quickly evolve to become the dominant part of the do-it-yourself market because it lets and as it lets an LSP jump into MT quickly and be productive just from their own feedback and from their own interaction with the engine. Um, 
you know, I think that for 2017, except for these big public portals, where, which they will all, I believe, shift to NMT, in the professional b world, I think phrase-based SMT will still be the dominant MT model, especially for the highest quality end of the market. There is an um, ongoing problem in the industry, and you know we see that after all these years of all and all this discussion about how blue is not a great measurement of quality of an MT system, and you see especially in the Moses com community that people do it really badly and they do it so badly that they they come up with really good scores and then people look at the MT output and say this is completely rubbish you know how can you have such a high score and you know give us give us this rubbish it's when you don't know how to, what you're measuring and how you're measuring that's actually quite possible um, Taos and the the European Union have attempted to provide some f guidance and guidelines on how to measure MT output better but these the guidelines are so complex and so expensive to implement that they're not really viable and so people just resort back to blue because blue the, the thing about blue you know and, and what's important about a quality measurement is that you need to have three four five years of measurements that you can use to compare hundreds of different systems against so you know that okay on that language combination and with that post editing experience we had a blue of 36 and you know the post editing productivity was 7000 words and you know you begin to piece together what is working and what is not um, the industry as a whole I think really needs some kind of a trusted effort score like how much effort is it going to take to make this empty useful for a business application you know whether it's you know straight you know like like uh, Tony described he's got this FAUT where output is going directly to the web it's not going through any post editing but it's still you know you need to have a, some kind of score to realize that, okay is it good enough to just send to the web now you know and the measurements need to be more sophisticated than a blue score um, so you know the, the importance of this accurate assessment is it allows you also like when you begin a, a project and some a customer comes to an LSP or t, you know an enterprise says we want to make these 20 million uh, words um, av available in these five languages how do you know that it's going to be good enough to be useful because if you put complete garbage out there it's not going to further your business initiative it's not going to help your business mission of engaging more customers and you know having more uh, uh, interaction and having you know providing better service to your global customer so you need some better assessment methodology on is the empty good enough and blue is also is, is a word-based um, measurement tool and it has been good so far it tends to favor phrase-based and statistical machine translation so it tends to score them a little bit higher it, it makes rule-based systems look worse than they than the human might actually say it is and it definitely makes neural machine translation also look worse than the human responses you know so when we look at neural machine translation output the feedback coming from many human beings is that this is way way better but when you look at the blue scores you're seeing two three or sometimes only even one blue score improvement so the, on the blue score level it's not reflecting the significantly more positive output that you know the, the feedback you're getting from human beings are saying yeah this is way better so anyway the industry needs this because the better the measurement the more effective your use of the technology and you know technology all this neural and phrase and adaptive these are all wonderful terms but in the end what we're trying to do is get better machine translation that enables business to get done faster you know why does Amazon translate their product listings into several other languages because it helps them get customers in new in new countries you know at a level and at a scale that is not possible without doing that but it has to be good enough if it's completely a frustrating experience if it's complete garbage 
customers are just not going to look at it. And so to understand whether we're making progress, we need measurements, but they've got to be quick, they've got to be cheap, they've got to be easily repeatable, they've got to be easily implementable. And so there's a need in the industry, and hopefully people like Tony will come up with some kind of scores, you know, where they take some of the knowledge in Taos, it's DQF and MQM, and reduce and find new scores that give you accurate measures of what is your MT like. And rather than have customers get bogged down with the, you know, with the DQF and the MQM stuff, which is wonderful, but it's way too complex and way too slow and expensive to use. Um, I have seen many MT systems, excellent MT systems fail because the compensation for the post editors was very arbitrarily established and was perceived as unfair. So when you, you know, if you need post editing for machine translation output and you want, you need human beings to do this and you want these human beings to do a good job, th there has to be some sense of fair and reasonable compensation for the work done. So the more correction you do, the higher the compensation. You know, this I think this is the basic human requirement that is needed. You know, machine translation is only going to get easier and easier to implement, but the number of human beings available to fix and improve it and the number of translators available is growing so slowly that there is a shortage and that shortage will get more and more urgent as the world becomes more and more global. So we need to solve this problem as an industry, to be able to really, you know, use this technology to solve business problems that, you know, enable trade. So, you know, we know that improper compensation can cause failure, even with re relatively good engines. The current practices are too arbitrary. You know, there are some people that just say, okay, any MT, we're going to give you 60% of your regular rate, and they don't look at the actual engine. So. I think most translators are asking, you know, link the pay to the engine. So if the engine is a really good one, then we understand that the pay can be much less. But if the engine's not that great, you know, then we should be paid higher. So in some languages, like Japanese and Korean, empty engines are not as good as they are in Spanish and French and Portuguese. So, you know, the pay rates need to be higher for those kinds of languages. And again, you know, there's, you want there are a few LSPs I know that have developed through their own practice, you know, and because they measure the performance of translation projects very accurately and very carefully, they know exactly what throughput is on, an, on any project they've ever done. You know, and so they have hundreds, sometimes thousands of projects of historical data. And if the industry were to collaborate, so if all, if 10 LSPs and 10 enterprises say that we've built 2,000 MT engines and across all these languages and we've, you know, post-edited all of these and here's the data, you know, that here's, here were the blue scores for those engines and here was the post-editing throughput rates, you know, so, you know, we know you can come up with ways to build new metrics that actually give you really good um, input right before you begin a project. And I think this is a very important thing for the industry to develop. And, you know, if the industry doesn't develop it, you know, then you're, you're leaving it to, to vendors to try and figure this out. Um, and either a few LSPs might figure it out and have something that works relatively well. Or, you know, maybe people like Tony will say that, okay, I will make an attempt. And, you know, I understand it's not perfect, but it's better than what's out there. And, and maybe this is a way you know, to forge forward and, you know, and I think this is some, this is an opportunity for Canton to, to show some leadership and because you don't, you know, all this NMT and all this stuff sounds all very sexy, but this is what, where the rubber meets the road. And I think if you do this right, all the other stuff will follow. So anyway, that's the, you know, the comments I had about, uh, about where machine translation has been and where I think it's going. And uh, thank you, Tony, again, for involving me with this. And I think we go to questions now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kirti. 
Um, we actually already have a few questions, but uh, we'll have to wrap this up a bit quickly. First of all, uh, maybe Tony, you can deal with a comment about MQM that we have here. Yeah. Um, hello, um, Alan. This is a, a comment from um, um, Dr. Alan Melby, and he's just pointing out, and correctly so, that while the MQM process is very comprehensive with it, which it is, you can actually use only a subset of the MQM process if you're thinking of measuring um, quality, which kind of improves, I guess, or reduces the complexity um, from an operational point of view in measuring quality. And I just want to echo, echo that and say that is correct. Um, in fact, we only use six factors of the fully factored MQM model ourselves when we measure quality um, using our own platform, Canton LQR. And I know the dynamic quality framework, the DQF, as um, a subset of the MQM as well. So uh, well, well pointed and a uh, point well made, Alan, and I'd just like to echo that, that that is actually the correct situation there with MQM. Brilliant. Thanks, Tony. We'll just quickly go to the next question in that case. The question is, how do you deal with quality concern with FAUT, specifically if it's for e-commerce companies where right product data is crucial for closing the sale? Okay, so I guess I should take that um, fully automated uh, usable uh, translation. Well, the way we actually tackle that problem is on two fronts. The first front is um, anybody that tells you that they can build a high quality uh, machine translation system with, without the involvement of professional translators is not really going to deliver a high quality engine. You've got to get the professional translators involved in it. So when we're building an engine that's going to go into production and deliver a fully automated usable translation, we it'll take us approximately six to eight weeks to build that engine. And we're talking about a broad domain engine, possibly about a billion words of training data. Half of that effort, or more than half of that effort, will be involved with working with in-country translators to test the engine, to test the output of the engine, and make sure that it adheres to certain quality criteria, such as terminology use, um, um, brand name recognition and translation, uh, maybe some um, name density recognition and translation and so on. So we work very closely with professional translators. And we don't sign the engine into production. They sign off on the engine into production. So first of all, to get into production, the level of quality the level that you have to achieve is very, very high, and that's driven by the involvement of language experts. As I said, it's vitally important that they are involved in that process. When the engine is actually in production, then we can use our quality estimation technologies. Just um, very similar to what um, Dirty mentioned, we can actually create a translation for a segment. We can measure the quality of that translation. And if we see that the scores are starting to diminish over time, let's say, starts off, the engine produces quality in the range of 70 to 84 percent. But we see that drifting over time. That's called content drift. And um, we will start to look at the engine um, with, with a view that it may need retraining. It may need to be updated with new terminology. Or perhaps that the, the, the engine has gone out of the domain that the content it's translating is not suitable for the engine itself. And that's the way we monitor it. And now all of this monitoring, by the way, is automatic all done by automated measuring systems. So while they're not 100% um, error free, they do give you a very, very good indication of what's going on in the, um, in the actual engine itself. So that's how we actually do that. We use professional translators to build the engine and then automated systems to constantly measure the quality that the engine is producing. Well, Tony, can I add a comment to that? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> Um, Microsoft has been doing, you know, converting their knowledge-based content using machine translation for like as much as 10 years now. And they have a process where they use human beings, so they have blue scores. So they know what blue scores are on the engines and they, obviously when you get a better blue score you think, okay, this engine is better, but is it good enough? We're not sure. Let's ask human beings. And so they have a very systematic way for human beings to rate the knowledge based content output and they over time because they've done it hundreds and thousands of times they have learned to do human assessment in a very objective and very consistent over time way and so they know that okay when the human ratings you know so they have a rating score of one through four or one through five and they say, okay, when it goes over 2.5 we believe it's good enough to put on the web and just take you know, 20 million words and put them up there. And 
so that is a, a methodology that is used. But human beings, when you're t taking eight, 80 million and 100 million words and you want to suddenly put them up on the web in a different language, human beings have to be involved. Blue scores are not enough. And you need some, but you, the problem with human beings is that, you know, some human beings will score very strictly and some will score very leniently. So you need to find a way to make that objective and find, um, you know, to, to make it work over time also. Because what happens with these engines is that you don't just do it once. You might update the whole, you know, the, all 20 million words on a monthly basis as the engine improves. And w when you see that people are reading, like the, another thing Microsoft does, when they see that people are reading a lot of a certain kind of content, they go and post edit that. So what defines the, the content that gets the most attention in terms of quality improvement is what are people reading. You cannot make 20 million words across 100 languages all the same quality. So what you do is you find what matters and you focus on that. Thanks. That's... Thank you very much, Kirti, um, for that um, follow-on question. Um, we have a few other questions here. Um, Lumi, do you want to? All right. Um, I was just wondering, one of the questions that we have here is, uh, when it comes to empty engine measurement, it's quite a complex process. So would you mind telling us a bit more about how to go about doing this? Um, okay, I'll take that, Kurt, if you don't mind, just to start off. Yes, um, sure. I'll keep my, my answer as, as, as short as possible. Um, in Pantan, we measure um, machine translation quality at three different times. During the development of the engine, we use um, automated scores such as blue, tear, and F measure. And we use those automated scores to make sure that in the training of an engine, we get sufficiently high scores in terms of blue and F measure and, and low scores and tear that the engine will most likely produce high quality. Now, we don't know for definite during development, but it will most likely do it. So that's the first level of measurement, and that's a fully automated measurement system. The second level of measurement, then, is we engage with professional translators. We use a, a platform called Canton LQR, Canton Language Quality Review Portal. And this allows us to bring dozens and dozens of translators into the, into the um, uh, the evaluation of the output of the engine. So we take certain test segments, um, let's say some product catalog, uh, some technical pages from a manual, and we translate it with the engine. And then we send those projects out to um, a large number of translators. It can be one or two dozen translators who all evaluate the, translator, the translation. We typically use a subset of MQM to do that. We've made it very, very easy to use MQM on the uh, LQR portal. And we get that feedback real time. We have this real time dashboard that tells us who's doing what and how they're evaluating the translation. And by analyzing that feedback, we then use a corrective plan, create a corrective plan to improve the output of the engine. So there might be some terminology issues there. There might be some phrasing issues. There might be some common phrases that were not getting translated correctly by the engine. We make all those adjustments. And we go through that LQR process with professional translators maybe four or five times. And we're able to do a high number of iterations there, primarily because it's fully automated on the LQR platform. So that's the second point of, of uh, quality. And then the third level of quality is that when an engine is in production, we've got to monitor the quality coming from the engine. So we use a technology called Canton Analytics, which gives us a quality score. Um, it's a percentage score between 0 and 100% to tell us how good the engine is performing translation to quality. The higher that percentage score is, the better the engine is producing readable, highly fluent content. So there are the three points in time and the three different methods we use to measure quality. So we look at different dimensions of quality over different temporal time frames. Right, thanks, Tony. I'm afraid we are absolutely in the last minute here. There are loads of questions, but I'm afraid we can't really get to that today. But uh, we have made a note of the questions, and we will get back to you with your answers. And um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you, Tony and Katie, for this brilliant presentation. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank, thank you very much. Guys.